go and then double click and then the mic goes off. Okay, so question number one has to do with menu money and service. This ward, hi, I don't want to compete with you. Thank you. Thank you for coming and please keep coming in. <laughs> or close the door. Okay, so this board geographically is so disparate or possibly this desperate that it is being dubbed um, like a map of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Its revenue streams and infrastructure needs are equally disparate. So the question is, what will you, uh, what will be your process for fairly deciding how to distribute menu money and other revenues and resources, and how will constituents be included in those decisions? And the first person to speak is Cornell. So we now have to work with three distinct regions, the east side of the ward, the west side of the ward, and the central part of the ward. And so my goal from day one is going to be working with each and every community group, whether it's the East Village Association, whether it's Wicker Park Community, whether it's North Dearborn Association, and ensuring that resources are allocated equally and fairly amongst the, amongst the, uh, the areas of the ward. Because although we have different needs, although we have different desires for how our ward wants to look and how it wants to be at the end of the day, we want to ensure that you have all that works fairly on behalf of all the ward citizens. I live at 1130 North Dearborn on the east side of the ward, but that doesn't mean I don't care about the west side of the ward. I want to ensure that we make sure that you have access to all the resources. You will have an alderman who's going to be holding office hours, pushing out information, and making sure that you are taken care of. Sorry, Cornell, but that's not totally the question. Sure. The question is, how will you do this, and will you include constituents? Of course, and uh, I apologize if I didn't uh, explain that uh, part of that's going to be working with the local community groups, assessing their needs, assessing what's going on with them, and ensuring that we're developing a vision for that, that particular corner of the ward, for that particular block of the ward, for uh, the entirety of the ward, if possible. So that means listening. That's my process. It's going to be showing up to your community meetings at, at any of them and listening, to being an active participant and uh, ensuring that your voice is heard. Right now, unfortunately, the second ward doesn't have a voice because it's so new, because it was done to the detriment to get one alderman out, and now that we're left with uh, these different pieces of a ward that we have to make whole. So in the process, we'll be working with the community groups and listening and ensuring that your voice is heard. Thank you. And the second person is Alex Pettis. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, uh, Wicker Park Lutheran, um, for having us here. Thank you, Wicker Park Committee, for organizing it. Um, Elaine, Alyssa, thanks for having us and being our moderators. Um, this is Democracy in Action. Thank you all for being here. I'm privileged to be a part of it. Um, I'm Alex Pattison. I'm running for Alderman in this uh, crazy math war that I think looks more like a transformer. Um, but the, the ways that I want to do this do involve co constituents directly. Um, I have uh, would like to organize, will organize two things. First of all, a sister neighborhood program within the ward to connect neighborhood groups to each other. There are a lot of reasons to do this that we'll probably talk about with regard to other questions. But what I want is for neighborhoods to be able to understand the needs of each other's neighborhoods. 
Streeterville right now has not a lot of sense of what goes on in Ukrainian village, and the reverse is also true. So we're going to have to work on that and connect neighbors that way. The second thing I want to organize and will organize as your alderman is a second ward volunteer core program. And that program will help connect neighbors in the same way. And my hope is that you will have an understanding of each other's needs. And, and when I make the decision as to where that many money is spent, and I will make that decision because I believe that that's what you elect Alderman to do, you will have an understanding of why I made the decision that I made. Um, really quickly, on the east side, I, I do sometimes worry about the number of population. I mean, 70% of this ward lives east of the Chicago River. So we have to make sure that we're still representing the western communities, this one in um, Bucktown, Ukrainian Village. Um, but in the end, I'll make the decision. Um, with as much uh, input from citizens in those two organizations um, as possible. Um, thank you. And I want to just remind you the Wicker Parks project. Okay. Um, Brian Hopkins. My apologies. Thank you, and I uh, too would like to uh, thank the good folks here, especially uh, Pastor Jason for hosting and the members of WBC, the board members and volunteers alike, and the mission and the lane for serving as moderators. My name is Brian Hopkins, and I get this question quite a bit. Uh, the geography that encompasses this animal we call the New Second Ward is very unique, and it's generated quite a bit of conversation over the last couple of years. Um, I think that there is uh, a geography that divides the second ward because the neighborhoods are physically far apart. But what's more important than that is what unites us as a ward. The residents of all the communities in the second ward expect and demand good services from their aldermen. We all care about our neighborhoods, the people in this room here especially. I know you care about your community, that's why you're here tonight, because you want to make an informed choice about who's going to represent you going forward. I plan to be your alderman, and one of the first things that I plan to do is ask for a doubling of the allocation of menu money. Now, most of us do know what menu money is, but for those of you that don't, it's a pot of funds, it totals about $1.3 million that each alderman gets on an annual basis. Well, the problem caused by the new map, we haven't had any menu money spent in the neighborhoods that encompass the new second ward in quite a long time. There's a severe backlog of service needs in this ward. I've been out knocking on doors in this neighborhood since July, and I've heard from many of you about the need to fix the sidewalks, the potholes, trim the trees, fix the street lights, deal with rodent control. A lot of these things have fallen through the cracks because of the confusion about the new war. We have a backlog. We need to catch up. I'm prepared to do that on day one. I will seek the doubling of the aldermanic menu money for this war. The other aldermen may object, but when they look at what's happened, this ward is the only one out of 50 wards in the city that has really been shortchanged on many money allocation. It's unfair, it needs to stop, and as your alderman, I pledge to change that. Stacy. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you also to Jason Wicker Park Lutheran. Thank you to Wicker Park Committee. It's great to be here among a lot of friends in the audience. Uh, infrastructure issues. I have a lot of experience by working, just recently leaving the Alderman's office in Second Ward. I've driven this ward many times with the streets and sands head. I actually have 10 pages of notes at home of things that I'd like to see done already in the ward. Um, upon election and before I'm inaugurated, I already would be driving around with the streets and sands head and doing a comprehensive survey and putting together what I think are the dire needs right now. I was just talking to a gentleman the other night. He said Hoyne Avenue, um, the 1400 and 1600 block, is um, like a war zone. So there are certain needs we're going to have to address, address right away. Uh, sinkholes, um, things like that that can lead to larger problems. Larger. Um, the question is um, how you would go about this process. Right, um, getting to that. So I would do a list of infrastructure needs and then I would bring it to the community and see and, and gather their input and see if I'm um, on point of the things I think need to be fixed. I'll learn about any new issues that I think need to be addressed. And then from there we'll figure out how to uh, allocate the 1.3 million. And 1.3 million sounds like a lot of money. It really is not. Uh, a sidewalk alone to repay is $50,000. And I also like to look at how much we're paying some of these private contractors we are hiring to do some of this work because we are on a shoestring budget here. 
Uh, I know the idea Brian has of increasing or doubling the menu dollars, but realistically, we've had to uh, decrease. We have been getting a decrease in menu dollars almost every year in the automatic offices. So the idea is to stretch it as far as we can and do the most of what we got. Thank you. Thank you. And um, fifth is Steve. Are you there somewhere? There you are. So thank you again for everybody being here tonight. Special thanks to Can TV for covering the event and streaming it live. It's very nice to have the crew out here. Um, and let me say real quick, thank you all for being here. It is tricky to listen to six people give answers to the same question, so we appreciate your patience and uh, hearing everybody out here. So the word shape is the biggest issue when you try to figure out all these different communities and the needs of each community, because it's basically nine different communities that are stretched thin between this very undemocratically designed board. Uh, I believe I'm uniquely qualified to look at the issue of trying to make fair and balanced decisions for each side of the board, because I've worked with so many different communities around us right now. Across all of West Town, I've already been working with neighborhood leaders, business leaders, trying to unite the communities on working together and trying to find ways, even without spending any money, by simply using our efforts together and collectively taking control of our own neighborhoods. There's a lot of different issues I could talk about with that, but I'll stick right now to uh, the budget. Um, basically, I want to make sure that everybody feels educated in the board. Right now, I'm writing a second board newsletter every week because I'm making myself trained to know that every neighborhood needs to be represented. So I meet people, I talk about everything that happens. I don't want to repeat what everybody else said. We're all having the same kind of experience. But specifically, I want to bring participatory budgeting to the second board. I apologize for interrupting here, but the question is, what will be your process for fairly determining this? And will you include um, your, the constituents? Participatory budgeting. Everybody would have a chance to vote on a project that affects their immediate neighborhood. Okay. Thanks. Um, and last is Vita. Everybody can hear me? First of all, I want to say Merry Christmas to all my Ukrainian friends here. Merry Christmas, everybody. Christmas, I want to uh, also, I want to say thank you all for being here. That means you care. And Elaine, thank you so much for doing this. It really means a lot. I want to go on the record and tell you something. This map is not your fault. It isn't. You should not be suffering for that map. As your alderman, I will make sure you get the city services that you deserve. $1.2 million, as Brian said. That's our work. That's our money. That's not my money. That's your money. So why wouldn't you be involved in spending it? So when I become the alderman, I will go to every neighborhood association. I will get every one of your invoices, voices to tell me what is it that your neighborhood needs. And that's my attitude, and that's how we're going to get it done. Thank you. Um, the next question is about land use and development. Um, and the first person will be Vita. Will you create excuse me, will you create a development plan for the board and how? And will it include TLDs? And what part will community organizations have in the process? One of the most important jobs that all the men has is to character, to, to protect the character of our neighborhood. How does an alderman do that? All the men does that by being close and coming to every community and association and meet them, see what the needs of the neighborhood is. I respect people like Elaine that have been involved in the development. You as a people, you are the one who are picking the taxes. So we have going to involve every one of you in developing. Yes, I make the final decision, but I promise you, it will not happen without your input and the community input. And we'll end with the TODs. 
Absolutely. Okay, and the process is just going to the various community organizations, is that right? Right. Okay. Every community has, every community, you guys have done so much for so many years. You have to be involved in this process. Thank you. Steve? Thank you very much. Okay, so land use. Um, the interesting thing is what you see are the differences in development on each side of the ward. Now, over here, I assume a lot of you are local, you know that some of the issues are teardowns and quick three-story, four-story, four stories go up. One of the issues there is materials. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of architects about you make a design, you design a building, you want to make it with the right materials that will last long enough so somebody has a 30-year mortgage, their home doesn't fall apart on them. One of the things is that in the developer side, Sometimes they'll cut back and use different materials that will then cause a lot of problems for people who buy into these houses. Seven years down the line, you might have an entire wall already degraded where you have to do major reconstruction on the outside of the building. So I want to see a lot more accountability for material use, which is not something that we're doing a lot right now as a city. It's a conversation that needs to happen more often. But first and foremost, you're never going to see me take developer money. I don't ever compromise community. Steve, I'm sorry, you're going off point here. The question is, will you create a development plan? We've got another land use question coming up. So, um, will you create a development plan for the ward and how? And will it include TODs? And what okay. part, how will you get the community involved? Yeah, you have to forgive me. There's a lot to talk about with the second ward. Uh, the development plan will be to work directly with community organizations to make sure that if there is a plan that comes in, that the community will have a chance to have uh, a hearing, a debate, a conversation about it. And anybody that knows me knows that I put a lot of effort into community discussion. So you'll always have open accountability with my office and any kind of development. So that's my development plan, is to have open accountability. TOD, we've got the Gold Coast Jewel plan over on the east side of the ward at Clark and Division. One of the things that's happening there is they're building right next to the red line stop. So you're going to see in the next four years a major development happen on that side. You're, you see a lot of these plans come along and they make, there's a lot of good points to making them that you want to take less cars off the road. But in reality, you have to make sure that it works for the community and it's not being overbuilt. Thank you. And the next person is Stacy. Thank you, Elaine. Um, when it comes to development, the only approach I will take is community-led development. Uh, this has stemmed from my years working for Preservation Chicago. I was a community advocate, advocating for our historic places and spaces. Um, I'm in favor of long-term development planning. I think it probably has to go by a community, each different neighborhood. Um, for those that don't have long-term plans in place, I would like to put in five-year growth plans, so then we're not bringing in project after project. We're going to look at, at, at a comprehensive whole, and then that way we can look at the character of the neighborhood we have, the framework in which that development should uh, come into. And um, I just think in government, too many times we're looking at the, the, what hap is happening today. We're not doing long-term planning on how is this going to affect our neighborhood 25 years from now. Do we have the infrastructure in place? Do we have the transit? transit options available if we are putting in uh, TODs. Uh, one of my issues right now is um, overdevelopment in some neighborhoods in Lincoln Park. I actually see a friend here from there. Um, with transit-oriented development, you have to have um, make sure we have a strong transit system in place. Uh, too many times, especially at Clark and Division right now, you have to wait for four trains just to get downtown uh, during rush hour. So that's a concern. And also, I'm the only one uh, of the candidates here that has pledged not to take developer dollars. Uh, I believe that uh, paid influence should not be part of any decision making when it comes to development projects. You should have fair-minded decisions. Um, and I would also encourage people to see where the money is flowing into in this race. And uh, I do have some opponents that are taking quite large contributions from developers and uh, and special interests. So we have to look out, I'm going to be looking out for your interests, it shows in my D2s, but you know, words and actions should come together and I feel strongly that I'm the right person due to my community background. Thank you. Brian? Uh, 
the, the answer is absolutely, unequivocally, yes. Uh, I am, I believe, the only candidate uh, in this race that has actually worked on a community master plan for a neighborhood. I've done not one, but two uh, during my 16 years representing one of the neighborhoods in the second ward. Um, I have experience of doing this, and not only do I commit and pledge to come up with a master community development plan for every neighborhood in the second ward, but I'm actually excited about the idea, and I'm looking forward to going through the process once again. Uh, during that process, the community organizations will be at the forefront. Uh, all stakeholders in the neighborhood need to be involved in it, not just residents, but commercial interests as well, institutional interests. You have to bring everyone together. It's all of our community. Uh, we all share a stake in it. But I believe residents should be first and foremost. There's more of us than there are of them. So the residents' needs are always paramount. But you absolutely have to have a master plan for a community. Uh, that gives you the strength to tell developers no when they come to the community with an idea that might be profitable for them, but would have a detrimental impact on the neighborhoods. And frankly, this area is really ground zero for neighborhoods for sale. We all know what happened here. Uh, it should never be allowed to happen again. It's an example of what happens when development interests are allowed to do whatever they want, unfettered, uh, do things that are out of character, out of scale with the community. Uh, I would never allow that to happen. As Alderman, I would pledge to pick up where Alderman Wagas back left off. I think he did a pretty good job of turning things around. They were clearly headed in the wrong direction. So I would very much look forward to overseeing an inclusive and transparent process to come up with a master plan for every neighborhood in the second ward, and then the next phase is sticking to it. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Alex? Yeah. By the way, just so you understand, I set this all up so every, no question is asked in the same order. It's, oh, that's why you're passing that sucker <laughs> is I would have a development plan. Um, I think I touched that. Um, and, and one of those things that has to be considered in this ward in particular, is, and that I'm happy that at least this part of the map worked out for us, is we have a real problem with east-west transit on North Avenue. And it is the one street that connects all of us. Um, and, and I think most of you are aware, many of you are aware, that there will be, or potentially could be, a major redevelopment in the Finkel Steel land um, right off Clyde and North. So whatever we do, there has to be a comprehensive part of that plan that takes into consideration all of the transportation needs for us and people around us um, who got cut out of our work. Um, I support transit-oriented density, and I uh, want to make a clarification on the Gold Coast um, development, North and, um, I mean, Division and, and State, Division and Clark. Um, I spoke to the developer there and the lawyer at a community meeting, his lawyer, and he, they said they didn't take advantage of parking spaces or of transit-oriented density at that building, and so they, because they believe parking spaces are required for every unit. I actually would ask developers to take advantage of transit-oriented density and reduce the number of cars and parking in a building wherever possible because that, that makes our neighborhoods more livable and walkable and easier to get around. Um, another priority of mine, community organizations will absolutely be a part of that process in determining um, the community, the development plan, but I also want to be very clear that I will make affordable housing a priority in that plan wherever possible. Um, I'm dedicated to that concept. I believe that our city is a vibrant one when we protect people. Um, and so my, that will be a priority of mine. And the last thing I want to say, was that one click, two clicks? When it, com when, when it comes to um, being victimized by, by poor building materials, it's a critical issue, especially on the west side. Okay, Cornell, grab the mic, please. Okay, let, let me just answer the question. Yes, I will work with every community to develop a plan for the ward, and yes, I'll based on transitory development. But let's add some new ones in there. The key is to understand that in my side of the ward, in my church at Fourth Presbyterian, across the street is the Hancock Building. Across the street from this ward are homes. And so you have to understand that we must defend your idea of what you want this neighborhood to look like, what the central portion of this, of this ward wants to look like. So it's not enough to say I'm going to develop a master plan 
for the entirety of the war. That's just not possible. What you must do is work with the local community groups and develop a plan for each section of this war. You work, whether it's working with North Branch Works to work, figure out how you're going to uh, plan for the central part of this ward, work, figure working with Wicker Park Community Resource Association for this uh, section of the ward, or working with SOAR or North Dearborn Association for the east side of the ward. Working with them on a daily basis to understand that we must uh, develop a plan for each section, listen to those residents, and adhere to it. My background is in city government. Uh, my background is a little different. I draw my experience in the Marine Corps. I draw my time uh, working in uh, when I was deployed in Djibouti, Africa, working with people who didn't, have, didn't even speak the same language, developing schools, developing hospitals, understanding what they wanted uh, for their community, and ensuring that the civil affairs teams that were over there uh, respected that, that we're digging wells and they're not in a sacred uh, area, or but we are responsive to their needs. So I will take that experience, I will take my uh, training as an attorney, dig deep into the law, understand what you need, what's best for this community, go forward and defend it, and defend your vision for the community. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next one is also a land use development question. With very little vacant land in this ward, development falls into two types, renovation or teardown. If someone or a developer wanted to develop a parcel of land, what would you do and how would you engage the community on development and zoning issues, including whether you would encourage teardown or renovation? And the first one is Steve. <coughs> issues on one side or the other side. What I know most is the west side of the board because that's where I've been most involved. So directly this last summer, there was a redevelopment of St. John's Church down at uh, Point and Point Walton in Ukrainian Village. So one of the main things that we did was to try to make sure that first, neighbors had a chance to meet with the architect. So we all met outside, it's about 75 people, and we were able to walk around and look at the building and talk about the changes and talk about what was going to be saved and what was going to be changed and torn down for the condo development. That then went to a vote to our community group, which then we approved it because the changes that were made were done with what the community wanted. That's the ideal situation. We had enough time to organize education to be done for neighbors. We did a four block radius hand delivered note to everybody who lived there. So they all, everybody knew what we were going to be doing, what we were going to be voting on. That is the best way to deal when you come into uh, anything being redeveloped, is that you get everybody directly involved on what the process is going to be, understand what's going to be said. So as an alderman, I want to make sure that that happens. Because you have to have accountability when you talk about any teardowns or redevelopment. Now, Finkel Steel, that's going to be torn down. I've already had lobbyists come and talk to me about, you know, that if that all went residential, think of all the property tax money. But neighbors over there are concerned about that all going residential. It's all this huge plot of industrial land along the river. And the concept is right now that if it stays mostly industrial zoned, you could have not only research and development, but you could also have the potential for working lofts. You can bring jobs into the war, and you can fix some of those transit issues that we talk about with the three main bridges over the river right there. So with that, accountability is key. Everybody's getting their work out today, so. Um, am I too loud, guys? Can you hear me? Renovation. You know, some people have been here, like, Elaine, since 1976, and I cannot just come here and take over and just decide everything has to be turned on. This is something that I absolutely need. Everybody's, every community, every neighborhood input in this. However, in Gold Coast, there are some park buildings that look like you just walk into Afghanistan, and that's not acceptable. When you turn the building down, you have to have a plan to bring it to life. You cannot just bring the building down and just leave it and uh, 
hope for the best. So when it comes to turnout, I have to have the community's input on this. When it comes to renovation, um, as your alderman, I will make sure that renovation goes as sweet and as smooth as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Alex is next, and uh, while you're passing the mic, I will just make a comment that in our area we do have landmark preservation areas, and obviously we're not talking about teardown, thank you very much, in a preserve. I did, no, you're fine. I just wanted to make sure people were thinking that term. No, you're fine, you did good. Okay, Alex. Is it on? Yes. Um, I would encourage renovation whenever possible, and I, I think um, this this neighborhood in particular exemplifies exactly why. I, you look, look across the street at Hoyne and Lemoyne, those two beautiful homes that um, five years ago I would run by them, and they were maybe six years ago. I lose track of time. They they were um, they looked dilapidated and they weren't well cared for, and now they've become beautiful, beautiful homes, the kind that you want to bring people by to see, to, to show them what Chicago's all about, what Chicago's neighborhoods are about. Pierce Avenue down this, just right around the corner, beautiful homes. Um, and, and what we did uh, in this neighborhood at the Walgreens in, on the corner, at the Six Corners, beautiful to save that building, turning an old bank into a Walgreens. Whenever possible, I would encourage um, re renovation as opposed to tear down. That, that said, that doesn't mean it's always the right choice. So it really would be situational. Um, but I would also look to the community for direction on that. Sometimes people see beauty in things that others don't, and, and I'd be happy to hear community groups when it comes to that. Um, Parcels of land become what we make them, and I, every group, every neighborhood group in this um, in this ward would absolutely have an open door. I would I would come to your neighborhood organization meetings and listen to any of your thoughts on the issue. Thank you, Stacy. Excuse me, it's Cornell. Stop it, Cornell. Sorry. All right, if, if we're talking about uh, the process to determine whether we're going to do uh, renovation or tear down, I'll tell you the same thing that I told the uh, North Third Board Association. It's on videotape. You can go to the website and look on the web. I'll send this developer and whoever's got an idea for it, I'll send them and ask them, have you gone to the local community groups? Have you asked the neighbors of this area what they envision for their ward, what they want for their community? And just like we're doing up here tonight, we're coming out to you, presenting ourselves, doing the hard work, and uh, all these good people want to do the best for the ward. And we want the best for you. And I'm going to tell this developer, hey, take the time out, just like we're doing, and talk to those community groups. Make sure that you're getting buy-in from the neighborhood and that they're working, that you're working with them. You're not coming here trying to oppose your ideas uh, uh, and thinking that you can give any of us some money and then just make it happen. That's not the way to work. So my process is to ensure that we are preserving the identity and character of a neighborhood wherever it is and making sure that those developers are coming and talking to you first and working with us so we can create a uh, collaborative effort and, and develop a ward holistically. Thank you. And now it's Thank you, Elaine. Um, of course, with my preservation background, that's a very sensitive topic for me, teardowns. Um, I will always choose with res renovation uh, as all pos at all possible. Um, and I would go to, right to the community groups. I would uh, immediately, if we have an issue in the ward of a vacant home that has been vacant for 10 years, um, dilapidated, becomes a safety issue, then that we'll have a community meeting right away with the local residents and local community groups and talk about uh, what is our vision there. Can we find a buyer that maybe would like to rehab that home and uh, restore it to its glory? Um, I love Wicker Park and the surrounding areas uh, due to the historic character you have here. I actually have uh, helped us facilitate some tours, historic tours of these neighborhoods. Um, but again, it would be community-led on any decisions made, and I would, would definitely fight for renovation and try to find a developer to rehab it at all possible. Um, with Finkel Steel, as Alex was mentioning, I've already started advocating uh, to city planning and preservation department to retain as much of the Finkel steel buildings as possible for character. Um, while in Detroit a couple years ago, there was a great use project of a 
uh, distillery district uh, that really reminds me of uh, what we have at Fingal. And besides the point of keeping our history in our city, we, our landfills are full of develop uh, full of building materials. And so, if all possible, let's keep as many out of the landfills as we can. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Brian. Uh, thank you, and I do agree with Stacy on this issue. Um, she has a, a strong background in historic preservation, and I respect her for it. Uh, my grandparents lived uh, nearly all of their 80 plus years uh, in a house, a 150 year old house on Winchester, a couple of blocks south of here. Uh, my parents also lived in that house for most of their life, and I lived in that house, and when I got back from college, I bought that house. Uh, I have a, a great deal of fondness for the housing stock of Chicago. The older homes are what give our neighborhoods character, and I believe preserving them at all costs is something that I think we should all commit to. Um, we have landmark districts for a reason, and, and that is to preserve the character and the, and the flavor of neighborhoods, but it's also an acknowledgement that even aldermen, as powerful as they are, uh, don't have absolute power over zoning decisions when it's a residential parcel and there's as of right zoning and someone that owns that property wants to do something with it. But we can do everything possible to encourage renovation and discourage teardowns in most cases. And I do think you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Community organizations have to be involved in those decisions, but not just community organizations. Neighbors who live on the block, neighbors who live on the other side of the block, neighbors who live in the landmark district, but might have an issue with the building just a few hundred feet outside, have to have a voice in those decisions. As aldermen, I will commit to giving all residents of the neighborhood a voice when it comes to preserving the character of that community. I'll do everything I can to protect the historic homes that we have, whether they're in a landmark district or not. Uh, I believe it's very important to do that, and the community has to be involved. Thank you. And that takes us to a use of public way question. So street festivals, which use the public way, have a big impact on residents and businesses in both the first and second wards. In fact, some also receive tax dollars through the SSAs. Currently, there is no financial transparency regarding these events. Many feel that a more equitable revenue share should come back to the neighborhood for schools and parks and other public use. So the question is, will you draft and sign legislation for the opening of books by all vendors and chambers of commerce for their festivals where the public way is used? And the first person is Alex. Ironically, this question was interesting to me because I, I don't think in the second war we were left with much opportunity to hold street festivals since we don't have any major, um, uh, not any, we don't have many major corridors, especially over here, of, um, of business. But um, whenever you're using the public way, all of the community has to benefit from it. Um, you're obviously using that land and taking um, that land from neighbors and, and di inconveniencing them for a weekend um, and the businesses as well in order to uh, host whatever festival is going on, do division or um, Whipper Park Fest, whatever it may be. Um, this has been a controversial issue, particularly on the west side of the war. Uh, what I want to step back and really understand before I commit to signing this ordinance or, 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 or drafting the ordinance and signing it it is where the discrepancy lies, and, and I'm not sure I do, to be honest with you. Um, the chambers that are getting the money, as I understand it, are 501c3 organizations, and they take on the liability for the alcohol, they take on the insurance liability, they are, there's a large cash outlay, as I understand it, on their parts to um, sponsor these festivals. So. I absolutely, I'm on the local school council in my community, I want to see some of that money coming back to neighborhood groups and, and organizations that participate, but I need to understand more from both sides where the money is going, and frankly, I don't have a great understanding of that right now. Okay. And uh, Cornell is second, and as you're passing it, I just want to make the comment that though the second ward did, 
does not physically have uh, festivals in this area except uh, at the um, where Wicker Park Fest and everything when it gets down to Milwaukee, Dayton, and North. But um, the aldermen in the second ward do have influences over what goes on in the parks um, in this area, and um, the aldermen have um, are supposed to be working together. So that's why the reason for the question. Um, okay, for now. Uh, let me let me answer your question. Uh, yes, I will support legislation opening the books. What I said says. I think transparency and accountability is good for government. I think transparency and accountability is good for people who want to use public rights of way. Bottom line. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight. But I will support such legislation to make it happen. I know that there was a historic meeting of uh, five different groups around here. Community groups that demanded more transparency from who people who want to use the, the, uh, uh, the right of way around here. Uh, it was the EBA, it was the uh, Worker Park Committee, and uh, uh, then and three other groups. Uh, and I will support that. Uh, I know that when you have the streets blocked off, those are your streets, those are my streets, those are our streets. And if people are using those uh, streets and saying that the money is going to go to one particular place or another, you need to have accountability for that. And you need to understand what's going on with your streets. So I will support that. Thank you. Steve. All right, so this is um, an example of the work that I'm already doing. I was one of the five people in the first meetings to combine neighborhood resources, neighborhood associations to work and draft a letter trying to hold the, the festival promoters more accountable, trying to hold the aldermen more accountable. What do we got? We got Fashion Fest, we got Wicker Park Fest, we got Green Fest, West Fest, New Division, New Orleans Fest. We have a lot of festivals over here. So we talk about traffic problems that come up. We had one weekend where we had uh, Division Street, Chicago Avenue, and Grand Avenue blocked. And you can imagine how much side street traffic came out of that. So one of the first things we did was, this is Ukrainian Village Neighborhood Association, Wicker Park Committee, Bucktown Neighborhood Association, East Village Association, and Chicago Grand Neighbors. We got together and the first thing that we said was, can we work together on something? And what are we going to work together on? Street festival accountability was the number one thing. So we led the fight to try to bring more awareness to the fact that there isn't a lot of accountability for where some of this money goes. You go to a festival and you say $5 donation goes to a local school. How much of it really does? How much money does the, I know the SSA, they take a lot of liability, but they also put money into their own nonprofits, which just funds the chambers of commerce. So who's holding them accountable? I would specifically work hard on Joe Moreno if he is reelected to work with me on holding these festivals more accountable for the way that they use our public way. Thank you. Um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, guys. Accountability and transparency. Um, I know that. We all know that. But as your alderman, I will actually, not only will talk the talk, will walk the walk. Because I do believe, as your alderman, I can help you to ask questions. Where is this money going? The money we just made, closing our public ways. The public needs to know where that money goes. This is your right. And don't ever let anybody tell you anything different. This is your right to ask questions. We want to know where the money goes, how it's spent. As your alderman, I will work very closely to make sure that we keep eye on where that money goes. Thank you for your time. I'm going to take this opportunity um, to ask the residents of Wicker Park and Bucktown and the communities in the western part of the second ward to vote for me as your next alderman. And if you do, and I'm fortunate enough to be elected, I pledge to you within the first 60 days of my term as your second ward alderman, I will introduce an ordinance that I'll write myself on a 
I've written hundreds of ordinances during my 20 years as a staff person for Cook County government. I will write this ordinance and I will introduce it in the city council and I will advocate for its passage. Not because I want to punish the groups that are sponsoring street festivals, not because I think street festivals are a bad thing. On the contrary, I am a big fan of street festivals. I go to several every year. I love street festivals. I love them so much, I actually organized one in Streeterville uh, a few years ago under the auspices of SOAR. We sponsored the first neighborhood festival in Streeterville's history. Uh, we broke even on our expenses, but Looking Glass Theater and the Alzheimer's Foundation uh, made a profit uh, from our festival, which I'm sure they put to good use uh, through donations at the beer tents. I happen to have some familiarity with street festivals, and I think they're a great thing for the community. They bring neighbors together, people have a good time, and they make money for very good causes. If that's the case, then why would we want to hide that? I don't think we do. I think people want to see that, and I think the organizations that do a good job sponsoring their street festivals will be very happy to show the good that those festivals do for the community and the community groups that benefit from them. Many of them rely on those donations that they receive for a substantial part of their annual budget so they can turn around and give back to the community. And the vast majority of the labor that goes into making those street festivals possible, and I know it's a lot of labor. I spent so many hours that summer that we did Streeter Fest. That is volunteer labor. That, that's people donating their time because they want to help their community and they want to have fun doing it. So street festivals are a good thing, and if there's a street festival out there that is doing something that they would not necessarily be proud of, I want to shine a light on it to stop it. Great, thank you, Elaine. Um, first and foremost, I will always stand with our communities, our neighborhoods, and our residents. And as a lone independent in this race, um, I also um, am very much in favor of transparency and accountability. I would sponsor this ordinance. Um, I've been hearing from leaders on this very issue when I met with them uh, for coffee the last three months. I met with the head of Bucktown Wicker Park, Bucktown head of Wicker Park Committee, and I've met with East Village um, leaders, and this is one issue that they're very passionate about. They have felt that their communities have been overrun with street festivals as of late, as of the last few years. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to limit, uh, set a limit of the number of festivals we have in these communities. I've read the guidelines that um, the five communities we've mentioned have drafted of what they would like to see uh, from the festival promoters, and I greatly support them in that. Uh, festivals are great and they are a fun time. Uh, it does bring tourism uh, to the neighborhoods and it does, is a way for the neighbors <coughs> to show off what they have. But um, even with an ordinance or piece of legislation, um, putting them uh, under some guidelines, the festivals will still continue, but it protects the communities that are trying to run their errands during these festivals and maintain also the character of the neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. So the last question before we go into our other two um, is about fiscal responsibility. What do you see as the top two or three fiscal problems the city is facing and what do you think should be done to address them? And the first person is Stacy. The top three things that we are need to address uh, the, the top two or three two. fiscal problems <clears throat> the city is facing, and what do you think should be done to address them? Okay. What are they and how should they be addressed? Uh, the top two, I think, uh, first of all, the pension issue uh, needs to be addressed right away. How are we going to meet this big pension payment in uh, 2016 that's coming up, $600 million? I was disappointed to see it not addressed in the 2015 budget. One way I would look to address that, uh, to meet our pension payments, we have seven pension payments that need to be made to our firefighters, our policemen, our teachers, our municipal workers. And um, I would look at TIF surplus. 
First, with TIF, we have to do reform. We have to look, uh, there are um, dollars available that we can help meet our pensions. And if that doesn't happen, uh, then I would look at taxes. Um, a tax that I'm looking at would be a local city income tax. I'm not for a property tax increase, and uh, I'm not for a commuter tax. But a local city income tax would be 0.5 to 1%. I think if we have to shoulder the burden, we all should shoulder the burden together and uh, make that increase as small as possible. The other thing I think we need is um, right now operating budget for the city. Currently we're having to borrow money to buy garbage cans and that's a big problem. So we need to do some um, cutting of the budget with wasteful spending. There are a lot of cloud contracts that are still given out unfortunately. Uh, with our school CPS I think uh, an article last month said that uh, the contractor is making $388,000 uh, to oversee some rehabilitation of a few of the school buildings. So we have to look at wasteful spending and I also would look at maybe city council in itself. Maybe we could downsize council to um, less aldermen, less aldermen staff. And um, if, if we're going to have to cut spending, everything should be on the table, including the city council. So, thank you. This year we looked at uh, approximately $300 million budget deficit. Uh, projections for next year are as high as $500 million. Um, we have a budget crisis in this city right now, there's no question about it. Um, I believe I'm the candidate who is best prepared to address it. Uh, for 20 years I've worked for Cook County government, much of that time as a budget analyst. Uh, I'm experienced in dealing with budgets, I know what to look for, I know where to find waste, I know where to find inefficiencies, uh, I know how to look for consolidation. There's things that you can do to make a city government operate more efficiently, and we have to start there. Um, right now, we are actually borrowing money for operating expenditures. Uh, that's inexcusable. It should never happen. Uh, we've accumulated a tremendous amount of debt. Right now, we're spending about 23% of our total revenue in the city goes to servicing that debt. Uh, it should be no more than 15%. We have to get that back down to where it belongs. We have to protect our rating from the bond agencies. It's fluctuated somewhat, but they look at the situation like what we're facing with right now with a possible $500 million deficit. And when we get downgraded, our cost to borrow goes up even more. Uh, we have to get our fiscal house in order. There's nothing more important. The pension system is also at a crisis due to chronic years of underfunding. Uh, I do not support diminishing pension benefits for current employees or for retirees. We've made them a promise. We have to keep that promise. But we also have to look for ways to reform the system going forward that would meet the muster of the court system, which has ruled that pension benefits are constitutionally guaranteed. That doesn't mean changes can't be made. Changes can be made. And we have to look for ways to do that. We have to negotiate with our employees' unions. And we have to bring all parties to the table to find a solution. Uh, I support TIF reform. We have over 160 TIFs right now. That's too many. Uh, many of them are not in blighted areas, and we have to review the way we do that. There's also TIF surplus money that's available. Approximately 20 million of that went to help close the budget deficit last year. There's more there. Thank you. Do I have to cut it down to two because I got so many problems? <laughs> well, well, you can I'm go three. Thank you. I'll go four. All right, guys. Very first one, as of yesterday morning, I was endorsed by our men and women, our Chicago police officers. That's, they specifically told me, you are our candidate. Now, because I believe that the safety of our neighborhood comes first. Without safety, nothing else matters. If our children are not safe to go to school, if our hardworking men and women are not safe to go to their work, and our senior citizen who have paid taxes so many years are afraid of walking down, what good the economic development does, which is my next one. We have to work on our economic development. We have to make sure good paying jobs are brought to our local neighborhoods. That's very important to me. 
mentioned, Brian, that Brian said that. Um, accountability, transparency. Oh, we're talking about fiscal problems. Okay, city services then. It's a big problem. We're paying taxes. We should need to stop borrowing money. It's like taking a second mortgage to pay for your groceries. That cannot be happening, guys. So let's just fix that problem. Make sure we're spending our money right. Thank you. Well, um, first, uh, I just want to share that um, I tend to be a bit progressive. I would, I would join the Progressive Caucus right away. I'm not a greedy person in life. I, I work in ed educational television. So you work for a nonprofit, you learn how to get by with you know whatever money you can make. The city is not uh, being accountable to the people that are paying taxes, that are paying into sometimes secret taxes like TIF. You know, there is a lot of reform that we can look at for different things. Pensions, you know, talking about the two main pensions that we usually talk about, police and teachers. With pensions, you have you have to fix these because right now we have overworked police officers and the city's paying all kinds of money in overtime just to avoid hiring more officers. So you keep kicking these pension deals down the road. You know, any one of us up here who gets elected, you know, we're going to have to deal with what other generations of aldermen have been continually pushing down the road and not paying into. So we have to be held accountable for a lot of the past problems that aldermen have created for us. With teachers, I'm on the local school council for Columbus Elementary. I see firsthand what that school has to go through with finding ways to pay for things in the budget. In years past, we had to sell off a parking space just to pay for the website development to be done. You have to find any way you can to pay things off because the budget is that tight. We need to find better ways to fund reducing the classrooms, bringing in more programs for after-school kids, trade programs. But it gets back to bond debt. We have this crazy amount of bond debt that's been building up since the mid-90s, and it only seems to get worse. So we have to find ways to make sure that we avoid bankruptcy. We need to restructure on our own. Thank you. There is no greater crisis than our pension fund. Uh, the city currently faces $297 million deficit in this year alone. Next year, that deficit will go up to $550 million just off pensions. That is the single greatest crisis facing us right now. And we are constitutionally obligated, and I would argue morally obligated, to pay those pensions. Those individuals worked their jobs, they did what they were told, it was their leadership that failed them. They kicked the can down the road, they, didn't, uh, they had lax contributions, poor return on investments, coupled with promising benefits that they knew they couldn't pay for. So where does that leave us? That leaves us having to look at everything we can do to pay into those uh, uh, pensions. We have to figure that out. That means increasing revenue. That means finding a way to do it. Now, I wish I could sit here and tell you that we can magically generate $550 million, but we can't do that. I want to work with the Office of Financial Analysis. I want to work to develop comprehensive, long-term solutions that will benefit this city and not, not leave us bankrupt. That will not put the burden all on you, the taxpayers, because you didn't do this. Once again, that was your leadership that failed you. And so anyone who comes before you and says, hey, this is going to be an easy fix, I got it, that's not true. We have to figure our way out. Like I said, the biggest pension is a pension crisis. Everything else is small change. Thank you. fiscal problems that I think are facing the city are our $14 billion in general obligation pension, I mean general obligation bond debt, and then our pension debt. Um, and our pension debt, just for one example with our teachers, is $8 billion. Um, the one thing I would start with is that I'm not in favor of finding revenue in property taxes. I would like to see the legislative body of this city start to act like a legislative body. And I think what that means to me is um, as a co-equal branch of government, our city council needs to take 
a, an active role in, in laying out all the potential ways we could pay this debt. Um, it, it could be tax increases, but not property tax increases. Um, but but debating them, really having a, a robust debate that involves our own new independent budget office and that proposes to this mayor ways in which we can start to begin to pay down this debt and that pushes back on his budget. Because frankly, um, for years, our council hasn't pushed back and that's why we are where we are today. The third issue, I think, is um, lack of police on the street, which I, I think we really need to um, fight for as, as a city council. Um, two ways that I would do that, I, I would like to see us really look, in, in terms of TIF reform, I would like to see us look at an ordinance that says, why, right now TIFs are 23 years. When they're very successful, why can't we have triggers in that 23 years to start to alleviate that, that um, uh, to start to cancel a TIF if it's doing really well. If it's really successful, it doesn't need to go for 23 years. And I think that would start to free up some money. Um, the other thing I would want to see is that we never sell off a public asset, like our parking meters, like our Chicago Skyway. And to the extent we anybody proposes that, I would like to introduce an ordinance that requires public hearings so you are a part of that discussion. I am not in favor of selling any public assets to pay any interest. Thank you. And we are, <coughs> we are down to our last two questions, which are 1.5 minutes each. <laughs> I'm going to ask the one I asked in the first board. Liz has been asked a different one than she did. And so um, the first person up on this one is going to be Ryan. And here it is. The claim by the mayor and superintendent that crime is down have been challenged on the basis of such points as population change and miss and reclassifying cases to lower categories of crime. Here's the question. What two specific things will you do that are not already being done by the mayor or superintendent to improve safety and fight crime? Right. Uh, two things. Uh, well, first, I, I was here earlier and I heard uh, Alderman Moreno uh, cite the statistics, and uh, I have no reason to uh, dispute those statistics. Um, they sounded good. They sounded encouraging. Crime is down in a number of different areas, but if people don't feel safe, it doesn't really matter what the statistics say. Uh, I would introduce an ordinance to mandate uh, crime reporting in a clear, concise manner. Uh, I know, for example, we, we have the clear system, the, the data is online, those figures that Alderman Moreno cited are publicly available. Uh, that's already there. But if people don't believe them, if there's a suspicion there, if there's no credibility in law enforcement telling you what the situation is, that's a problem, and we do have that problem today. Um, for example, if someone uh, snatches a purse, and as they're running from their victim, they snatch another purse, and both of those victims call 911 and the police respond, is that one robbery or is that two? Well, right now, police have discretion in reporting, and there's different ways to massage the crime statistics. People don't really trust the crime statistics right now, and that's a problem. I would support an ordinance to bring greater transparency, not just in the numbers, but in the way the numbers are produced. I think that's very important. I also support adding patrol office to the streets. Uh, I think all of the candidates here have said that as well. If we cut police overtime by 25%, that would bring an additional 250 patrol officers to the city. And I think. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Um, first of all, while I was working in the second ward office, I was the main liaison uh, with the different uh, police districts, 18th, 12th, and 14th. And I've attended many beat meetings uh, throughout the new second ward. Every cast meeting, we were told the crime was down, but yet every day there would be crimes reported in our office. So I'm not sure how much we can trust the statistics. We have to go by you know, what we're hearing on the streets. Um, I want more officers, and I'll find the money. Uh, this $100 million in overtime is not sustainable. Every year it increases. Uh, I want to say in 2012 or was it 2013, they said that it was going to be $32 million. 
in overtime expenses that end up being 100 million. So if we budget in 2015 for 100 million, what's it going to be? 175 million? Um, I know several aldermen, including Alderman Vegas Pack, who has endorsed my candidacy, asked at these budget hearings for police budgets, asked the superintendent over and over again for monthly budgets of where the money is going, and I don't think he's gotten those budgets yet handed to him. So there needs to be more transparency of how the police are spending their money. Uh, if there's wasteful spending, let's cut it and let's get more officers on the street. I've been hearing about crimes in these neighborhoods and also in the Ukrainian village, and they want more patrol. And then the other thing is focus groups. Let's find the problem corners. One thing the 18th district was doing, got uh, more residents engaged. Uh, Two things I would do. Uh, number one, work with our police commanders and ensure that we're doing community-based policing. What does that mean? Community-based policing, too often people throw it around as an empty platitude. For me, that means walking the blocks, knowing your neighbors. You should know who your police officers are that walk the beat every day in and out. You should know their badge number. You should have some sort of constant communication with them. That's what community-based policing means to me. That's what I did when I was trained on how to patrol. That's what we did when I actually was in Iraq and uh, deployed. I'm not an infantry guy, but the few times I did get to patrol, we walked around, we talked to people, we got to know them. They said, hey, the bad guys are over here, let's go find them. That's what community-based policing means to me. Second thing, let's target the source of this crime. We can all continue to be reactive, but now let's talk about being proactive. Go to CureViolence.org. They have a great program, they have great initiatives where they are trying to stem the tide of violence day in, day out, and they are putting great programs together to attack it at its source. And that means working with youth who are uh, disaffected by violence each and every day. It means providing jobs for them. When, when, when people have jobs and they have something to do, when they're productive, they're out there, not out there looking for crime to do, not out there looking for the next fix. So two things, work with the police commanders, doing community-based policing, that means 12th, 14th, and 18th district commanders. Our ward is a big ward in attacking crime at its source. Thank you. Thank you. The, starting with the statistics, um, we all heard about the woman who was shot by her boyfriend at Nordstrom, um, I think it was the night before Thanksgiving, and I'm told that that crime was uh, categorized not as she died the next day, it was not categorized as a murder for weeks, and I'm not 100% sure it's been corrected yet. That kind of um, discretion in how you categorize a crime has to stop, and that's one of the first places I would start, is the introduction of an ordinance to try to take that discretion out of, out of um, a, a CPD. Um, right now, the Chicago, Chicago Magazine has run a, a huge expose on this, and it's a, it's a true problem. We can't even get accurate statistics about where, where crime is and how bad it is or is not. Um, I am disturbed whenever I hear reports of an alderman being unable to get a budget from a major uh, agency of this city. I, I, am, I won't put up with it as an alderman, and you will all hear about it, and I hope you will, you will stand with me on that. Again, the city council is a co-equal uh, branch of government, and we have the right to that information, and I'll fight for it so that we actually understand what's going on in the budget. Um, as far as locally and what I would do as your alderman, <coughs> I, I talked earlier about a second board volunteer corps, and I would hope and invite all of you to be a part of that and be a part of positive loitering in the community. And I would also bring caps to us as opposed to expecting us to go to them, um, to my ward nights, to... Uh, Thank you. Vida? Has everybody seen my first piece? About over 20,000 people received that. We call the police, Neighborhood Watch. I have also, thank you, I'm, I'm a proud wife of a Chicago police officer. So, as I said it before, and I say it again, we need more police officers. We need to have them have support on the street. But I'm going to take it one step further of what the mayor is doing. I will not let another red light camera go on our street. And that's a pledge. That's a pledge. Let's get
get some more police officers because, let me tell you, the cameras are not creating safety. Our police officers are too. As of bringing the community and our police department together, I have been the girl who created positive loitering. I have been the girl who's standing out on the street making sure the bad guys know that I'm there. So definitely I need to work with our police officers and our community. But once again, no more red light cameras. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to thank Vita for mailing out all of the Neighborhood Watch flyers. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the real Neighborhood Watch in the area. What I want to do is replicate for the second work what I've done for West Town, okay? When I moved to Ukrainian Village, I had neighbors across the street. This is the first week I lived there. They got broken into on a Tuesday, and they came home on a Friday, and they got broken into again in the same week. There are crazy things that happen in the West Town neighborhood. What I try to do is bring neighbors together to talk about those things and educate each other on what's going on. How do you report things? How does 911 work? How does 311 work? Get everybody on the same page. We have caught catalytic converter thieves. We've even reunited over 100 do lost dogs with their owners. When you get people working together, you can do amazing things and do community building. So crime is one of those common things that connects everybody, unfortunately. You're either a victim of it, or you know somebody who else has. So these forums that I've created have touched over 10,000 neighbors. Now, what we try to do is coordinate efforts. I was out there fighting to save the 13th police station. When we lost that, I went to the housing committee and I testified against how horrible it would be to close that. Whenever somebody gets arrested, the cops have to be off the street for an hour. The second thing is we need a new police commissioner who isn't going to mess around with statistics. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more question. We have one more question which Alyssa is going to pose but before, before that, and I relinquish my little thingy here, I want to thank all of you for your time and your excellent, caring answers. And I want to thank all of you for being so courteous and listening. So, Alyssa, last question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to keep it real short, and I also wanted to thank everybody for being here and being so patient as well. Um, final question that I'm going to ask is just, do you think Mayor Rahm Emanuel should be re-elected? Why or why not? And we'll start, just, we'll start actually, wherever the mic is, and we'll start there. <laughs> so, Steve or Ryan? I'll take it. Okay. And then we'll go to Alex, and then we'll go down to the end. Uh, you know, what the mayor's done is he's put Chicago on the map, he's built up tourism, he's trying to focus on bringing conventions to the city, he's trying to empower a lot of the downtown business to last a long time. What he's not doing is he's not paying attention to the communities. When you close so many schools, when you don't do the research on how it's going to affect neighborhoods, and you basically take families out of so many different neighborhoods and make kids have to walk so far to go to school. CPS is closed again tomorrow, for those who don't know. One of the reasons is that kids have to walk so far to go to school because the school's closed. So there's a reason why you see some private schools stay open and why you see CPS closed when it gets so cold. Does the mayor pay attention to the communities? I don't think he does. So I, I wouldn't vote for him, personally. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Alex? Alex, yeah. I think the decision about who becomes the mayor of the city of Chicago is up to all of you. Um, I will tell you I have major disagreements with this mayor. I also agree with him on some other things. Um, when it comes to schools, having been on the local school council in uh, Wicker Park here at Jose de Diego, I absolutely disagree with the decision to close the schools and the way they were closed. I also disagree with the budget he's given us um, as a welcoming school. Um, you know, To echo a little bit of what Steve said, uh, at my welcoming school, we accepted uh, three other schools. They crossed 27 gang lines to get to school. 
Um, and when I say gang lines, they're now little little gangs. They're, we've done a good job of, of breaking gangs up, but now little gangs are popping up in their place, and these kids are trying to incorporate their lives and adjust their lives to that, knowing that their parents have issues with um, each other out in the streets. So that's one area I would disagree with him on. Um, but but I disagree a little bit when he when Steve talks about how whether the mayor has helped communities in in some ways I think he has uh, right now there's a, a tourism program that one can disagree with or agree with it isn't all about downtown there is a huge effort uh, it's called Choose Chicago to move people out into our neighborhoods to showcase them and 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 this mayor has, wants to do that and he wants to bring tourism here the, the 606 Bloomingdale Trail is a part of that. Um, the new hotel that's being built at Six Corners is a part of that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fight for that that foot traffic to get out here. Thank you. Thank you. Then you're just right down the road. Uh, thank you for mentioning the 606, Alex, and uh, that's a good example of something that Mayor Emanuel did that I support. Uh, going back to before he was mayor, uh, when he was in Congress, he he fought for that. And I think that's a wonderful thing for the city. There's some things that Mayor Emanuel has done that I, I really agree with, and some things that I vehemently disagree with. Um, I'm glad that we're about to have a very spirited race for the mayor of Chicago. The citizens of this city deserve nothing less than that. Um, I've had the privilege of working closely with Commissioner Garcia for a number of years on the county board. Uh, he's an outstanding leader and a fine man, a man of integrity, and he's running a very spirited campaign. Uh, I've gotten to know Alderman Fioretti in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, I really liked what he had to say in his public safety platform that he announced a couple of days ago. This is going to be a good race, and we deserve nothing less. Uh, and I'm like you. I'm waiting to see how it plays out, and we'll be voting on February 24th for not just the second ward alderman, but for the mayor of the city of Chicago. Uh, I don't know who Mayor Emanuel is going to vote for on this table, and uh, so I'm not going to tell him who I'm going to vote for. Well, we're, uh, we're reaching out to all the mayoral candidates and asking what they're going to do for the second ward. They haven't responded yet. So we will keep asking them what specifically they're going to do for our neck of the woods and how they're going to promote and grow our city. So I'm going to look forward to the debates. I'm going to look forward to each and every one of them, whether it's uh, Chewy Garcia, whether it's Willie Wilson, whether it's Rahm Emanuel, getting up there and talking about how they're going to push this city forward. I know that the city was in dire straits uh, when Mayor Emanuel uh, came aboard. I know that he uh, got dealt a, a tough hand to work with, and it's only going to get tougher. And I think anyone who's going to assume the mayor's spot, is be on that fifth floor, is going to have a challenge ahead of them, and that's work with all the aldermen. Uh, no matter where they come from, no matter what their agenda is, they're going to have to work together. So I look forward to hearing all their uh, fleshed out uh, agendas, all their fleshed out plans. Uh, I look forward to seeing the debate just like we're up here before you and uh, making that decision at an appropriate time. I personally will not be voting for Mayor Emanuel, but um, you have to make that decision for yourself. I feel that when a public servant is no longer listening to the public, then that's when they should go. Um, he has uh, within the last six months when he has started his uh, re-election campaign, has started to listen to his uh, constituents, but uh, from the beginning, I, you know, he was handed a tough deck, as uh, Cornell said, and it is a tough job, and a lot of uh, tough decisions need to be made. I have good relationships, obviously, with um, Alderman Fioretti. I also have a good relationship with Commissioner Garcia. I would uh, look to work with both of them. I also will work with Mayor Emanuel if he's elected uh, to make sure the second ward gets whatever they need. Um, the other thing I also, with Mayor Emanuel, I feel that uh, we continue to concentrate all the dollars downtown when our neighborhoods are starving. Um, our roads, our parks, our schools, and uh, tree trimming. <laughs> Believe it or not, tree trimming, a lot of people have that on their mind. It was hard for me to have to tell people it may be a year to get your trees trimmed. That's ridiculous when you know they're paying a high amount of property taxes. So we need to take care of our constituents as our alderman. I'll make sure far and foremost that I will take care of you and your needs. And the new mayor needs to listen from day one and take care of his constituents' needs. Thank you. Million dollar question. Um, I have to first of all say that I don't want my opinion to affect your vote on the election day. That's a very important choice that you have to make. However, you have to remember that 
Ram Emanuel picked up where Daly's messed up. That's just the way it is. Um, do I have? Do I agree with all his choices? No, I don't. I don't believe he did the right thing with closing the schools. Um, I don't think he did the right thing by getting more police officers. He did have a lot of tough choices to make. And if he becomes the mayor, I am willing to work with him because I do not want the constituents of the second ward to suffer as a result of my disagreement with him. Because one thing we can, we all know, we have to learn to work together. We don't have to agree on every issue. And as an independent thinker, I believe, guys, I'm sorry, my English sometimes is not good. It's, I speak five languages, so I mess up sometimes. Um, as an independent thinker, however, I do believe I will stand from the constituents of the second war and I will work for the mayor if I need to. But more important than anything, you guys come first. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of your patience and great answers. And thank, thank you, you for everything.